I'm really very honored to be here uh, and very pleased to have come to such an interesting conference. I've learned a tremendous amount and I've enjoyed meeting other speakers and, and you know, and as well as seeing a little bit of uh, the wonderful city of Paris, but I wish I could stay a bit longer. I have to leave straight after my session uh, and uh, to go back to the UK and then to another meeting in Norway tomorrow. Anyway, but today I'm going to talk about gender ageing. Um, and I'm just going to begin by emphasising the earlier UK-US work on gender and ageing, um, which over many years has shown the disadvantages faced by older women um, for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, women's role in caring uh, for their children, husbands, rest of their families, throughout the life course. And this has led to older women's lower pensions, and higher levels of poverty in later life, and general lack of material resources in later life. A second disadvantage is older women's higher levels of disability uh, than men, older men, uh, and therefore older women have a greater need for care, uh, health care, supportive care from others, uh, particularly in frail old age. There are also higher levels of widowhood, uh, among women, and higher levels of women living alone. So one of the issues is, to what extent do these disadvantages still exist, uh, and are they changing, uh, given other societal changes over the last 20 or so years? Very many years ago, uh, I published a book uh, with my colleague Jay Ginn called Gender and Later Life. Um, and what we talked about here is what we called the, we called the resource triangle. But this was the kind of the three key sets of resources for older people to enable them to have what we would call a good old age, good later life, which is one of autonomy, independence, and well-being. Uh, and the, the three, uh, a range of factors influence these three sets of resources. A key one, obviously, is gender, which we wrote about, but cross-cutting that is class and class and gender, and also ethnicity. Um, and these three sets of resources all interact together. So older women have, as I mentioned, uh, lower financial resources because of lower pensions, lower income, uh, often have poorer housing. Uh, particularly the current generation of older women are less likely to own cars, and other assets, uh, and these material resources themselves impact on health resources, your own health resources, an older person's ability to provide care for themselves, uh, and also an older person's capacity to care for others, and given that women's role is to care for others. And as we've heard in other sessions, your class and your income have a major impact on your health and likelihood of disability in later life. Um, what I want to talk more about today, in fact, is access to caring resources. Uh, what sort of access, should you become frail and disabled? We all hope we won't become frail and disabled, but unfortunately there's something out there called the fourth age. Many people have physical impairments and disabilities or cognitive impairments, and they need care in later life. So what is people's access to caring resources, access to carers? And clearly they can come from different sorts of sources. They can come from the older individual's own financial resources. They can pay for care, but that obviously is related to their material resources and their class. Or they can come from other household members, particularly partners, uh, possibly children um, who can support them. Or it may like come from the community, friends, neighbors, and so on. Or they might come from the state. So, those are issues about access to care and the nature of those caring resources and how easy it is to get good quality caring resources will impact on an older person's autonomy, independence and well-being. So anyway, we, we wrote this 25 years ago, but a lot of it is still highly relevant today. But other things change. Right. Okay. Much of the earlier work, uh, my own work included, um, lacked uh, an emphasis on the advantages experienced by some older women 
uh, compared with older men. Uh, and much recent research has shown that older women have better social relationships uh, with friends uh, and they ha are more able to and better maintain uh, kinship relationships. And that includes uh, divorced older women and unmarried older women. And that contrasts with some work I've done on looking at subgroups of older men, particularly divorced older men, who often have very poor relationships with their children, if they had any, partly because of the divorce and the bad you know, effects of that. Um, and also unmarried older men, who are a particularly disadvantaged group, who often lack good relationships with their kin and their, their you know, if they haven't got children, most of them haven't, uh, but their siblings, children, they often have poor relationships with, unlike unmarried women, who often have very good relationships with their siblings, children, nieces and nephews and so on. So older women tend to be advantaged by better social relationships with friends and family. Um, widowhood as well, we used to see it very much as a negative experience. But actually, a lot of research has shown uh, in-depth interviews with widowed older women, widowed older men, that widows often say they have this newfound feeling of independence and autonomy. So one of my colleagues, Kate Davidson, for her PhD, interviewed 40 older men, widows, 40 older wi women who are widowed, and she asked the question, um, you know, sorry your husband died, or your wife died, you know, do you find any advantages in being widowed? And the women say, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry he died, blah, blah. But actually, I can watch what I like on television. <laughs> you know, I don't have to watch much of the day. And I don't have to have a meal every day on the table at one o'clock, which he wants. And I can invite my friends around. I can do things I want to do. So for a lot of widows, women who are widowed, once they kind of get over the difficulties of bereavement and so on, they actually find this new independence. And for the women, older women, they often have never had that independence in their whole life because they were a child, they got married young, lifelong marriage, and this is the first time they've actually been able to do some of the things they want to do. Um, but if you ask exactly the same question to a man who's widowed, I'm sorry your wife has died, but do you find any advantages in being widowed? And they look at you as if you're completely mad. <laughs> so for a man, there is no advantage whatsoever in being a widow. A man loses independence because they have to cook their own meals, wash their own clothes, do all their domestic work. They've been able to watch what they wanted on television anyway. So it's, it, it's a, there's no advantage at all. And then you can ask the same question about, would you like to repartner? And the women say, well, they look up to there and say, no, you know. And they kind of sanctify And most women don't actually want to. But they say, oh, I'd, li I'd like to go, you know, out cinema and things like that and so on. But not, not, not permanently live with another person. Whereas the widows, nearly m the vast majority, the widowers, the vast majority say they would love to repartner. Uh, and one of the problems with a student doing this work, as soon as she found a widower, a man who was widowed, they'd almost be repartnered before she could arrange the, the interview. So it's much more problematic. So widowhood is a very gendered experience. It means something very different for men and for women. And for widowed men, it's, it's, a, it's often a more difficult experience than for widowed women. Uh, but widowed men often get a lot of support from their children, unlike divorced men, older men who don't, uh, and unmarried older men. So. Um, so another kind of aspect is what, what uh, La Hapata and others have called the company of widows, that widowed women often find positive relationships and activities with other widows, other women who are widowed, and that sort of support. Whereas in the UK, there isn't the same kind of company of widowers. There aren't the same sort of support groups for widowed men. Um, but obviously, we need to recognise that all of these factors are conditioned by access to resources. So you can be independent if you've got financial resources and, and widowhood can be a positive experience and you've got financial resources to maintain your social relationships and so on. So, but we all need to consider societal differences. So there may be very, very dig big differences between societies in terms of the meaning of being a, a widow or a widower. Uh, and we also need to look at the changes over time and to what extent that experiences 
uh, 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 vary uh, um, over time. Uh, and also the nature of welfare state provision. So welfare state is crucial for older people, level of pensions, level of support for health care of various kinds, community care, and so on. Okay. I think in this meeting we're all very, very well aware that to understand anybody, but particularly to understand older people, we need to recognise the importance of the life course perspective. So how earlier life, earlier life course, impacts on a whole range of different aspects of ageing and later life. Um, obviously a woman's reproductive roles uh, impact on their health in later life. If they've had children, if they haven't been able to have children but have wanted children, uh, that has an impact on their health in later life. Clearly also an individual's career uh, and employment. So for women, that generation of women, I'm a very fortunate one of them who's had a full-time academic career in a university, very rare. But, you know, I've, I have the benefit of a, of a male pension, of a pension which was designed for men in universities, which is very good. So I'm very, very privileged. But my sisters, who didn't go to grammar school, left school at 15, had very interrupted kind of clerical sales careers. They have virtually no pension at all. So they're dependent on their husbands for their pension. They don't really have any independent income in later life. If husbands die, then they, they're going to be quite financially, quite a problematic sort of situation. So an individual's career and employment influences their accumulation of financial capital, pensions, and also cultural capital, education, ability to find your way through the system of health care uh, and, and getting your benefits and rights and so on. And obviously also women's caring roles earlier in the life course impact on their social networks as well. So women who've had children often have networks with other mothers, other women uh, with children uh, and, and so. And grandparenting as well. So I'm a grandparent, which is wonderful. Um, but again, that kind of increases your social networks and, and, and has all sorts of positive uh, impacts and hopefully will give me a potential source of support in later life as well. But that's not why you're a grandparent. Um, okay, a second, and again we've heard about this in other sessions, um, to understand later life as well, we need to consider the importance of a gender role analytic framework. So both for midlife, say women in their 50s, early 60s, and older women as well. So a lot of midlife and older women still have multiple roles. They may be married, they may be a parent, and if you've got children who are in their 30s, you still do parenting for them and support them and worry about them. Uh, they may be a caregiver directly for their partner or their grandchildren or anybody else or neighbours and friends. Uh, they may still be in paid employment and increasingly in the UK, we're supposed to all work till we're late 60s, so we do all this. So multiple roles of, and requirements of marriage, parent, caregiver, paid employment, they all may influence mental and physical health, both in later life as well as for people earlier in the life course. And for many years there have been these two theoretical uh, kind of you know, frameworks. Do, do multiple roles lead to role enhancement? Uh, the more roles you have, you have more social contacts in the workplace and the child groups and so on, and more social contacts give you more social support, more self-esteem, and providing buffers to stress and so on. So role enhancement, lots of roles can be very good for your health and well-being, but also multiple roles can also lead to role stress and role strain, which can lead to ill health. So again, looking at grandparenting, I have the luxury of I can grandparent to some extent when I want to, or my parent, my my daughter says, you know, they're going away for a long weekend. Can you grandparent? I say, great, yeah, I'm well, happy to do that. But some women, they give up their own jobs to look after their daughter's children because they just feel their daughter is more important for their daughter to work. And they're grandparenting five days a week, every week, all the time. And that is incredibly exhausting. It's exhausting if you're a 30 year old, but if you're 60 or 65, that can really have, you know, adverse effects. And you lose that ability to do anything you want to do because of those grandparenting. So the same role of grandparent 
you know, depending on your control and autonomy and your position within a class structure, will impact on the likelihood of it being a very fulfilling, positive thing for your health or something which can lead to ill health. So for older women, what are older women, I don't know, but, you know, again, we have various culturally appropriate roles for older women. Might be a wife if their husband's still alive, grandmother. Increasingly older people, older women, are voluntary workers as well, and caregivers and so on. So and older people today have many, many different roles, uh, but it's how much control people have over those roles and to what extent that is health-promoting or not. So the health impact of multiple gender roles in both midlife and later life as early in the life course, uh, depends firstly on structural, material factors, people's resources, if you've got money, if you've got to pay for ca paid carers or to help you care. If you have got somebody to clean your house for you, as we do in England, um, if you've got money. Um, if you've got money and you've got a car that, and, and can afford to run a car, then the likelihood is you've got more control and autonomy in those roles and they're going to be more likely to be health-promoting uh, and so on. And similarly, another positive factor, if you've got the support of others, if you've got support of a partner, but again, in terms of partner, is the partner somebody who gives you that support because there's gender equality in the domestic division of labour, cooking, childcare, and so on, or is it that the woman actually is, is basically supporting the partner uh, and, and it isn't equal. So again, the nature of the partner's support and to what extent their gender equality in later life is terribly important as well in terms of health or not. And again, we think extended families is great, adult children, grandchildren are great, but if you've got conflict in those family relationships, then that can be very negative. So again, we need to look, nuance these issues. If you're in a couple relationship as an older person, what is the quality of that relationship? And if you've got a good quality of relationship and a supportive partner, then that's likely to be health promoting. If it's a poor quality of relationship and it's a partner who's totally unsupportive and unequal in, in anything uh, in domestically, then that's likely to have a more negative impact. And then, of course, the third factor, final factor, is the nature of welfare state provisions for childcare and elder care and so on. So what I want to look at in more detail later on is that the critical impact uh, of living arrangements whether an older person or older woman is living alone or with others has a major impact on the nature of their well-being in later life and also material circumstances um, economic circumstances money okay a third sort of factor which is crucial for older uh, women's health and older men's health um, we, we mustn't neglect. Um, then I was very interested that uh, uh, Christine mentioned in her talk yesterday about norms about dress and clothing and showed a lovely slide of a woman in a burqa swimming, uh, or not swimming, in the water. Um, and I, that really strikes me very strongly because I've, I've uh, done work in Saudi Arabia for a number of years with PhD students. They're women... PhD students doing work on older women and, and women's roles and so on. And she's, uh, my current PhD student is, is interviewing women uh, aged between 60 and 74. And these are older women for her. And all, it, and she's interviewed, I think, 40, 40 women, no, 50. Uh, and all except one of them have got three or more chronic illnesses. And they've got the most terrible health. And I keep saying, you know, I'm in the middle of your age range. I don't, you know, have these things. But they have terrible health. They don't do anything. They just stay at home and they wait for their family to come and see them because they're not allowed to go out alone. They, they have the, the guardianship system. Uh, means they, they, they obviously have, you know, obviously wear, you know, burkas and so on and so forth. Um, so they, they lack vitamin D, sun exposure. They have no exercise whatsoever. They, they, you know, they sit and watch television and eat and they have maids and servants to do everything for them. So they, they get no physical exercise. So these cultural norms um, are terribly important and we tend to kind of forget about them. But they're real uh, and they exist. And I think just down at the bottom, we have the new norm of active ageing. Older people are supposed to be active and they are. You know, 30 years ago, older women sat in an armchair, like Whistler's painting, and knitted 
uh, and that's all they did. But there are the roles now for older women are to be active, and most older people, if they've got the physical fitness, are act very active. But not amongst all cultural groups, not amongst in all societies. But, I mean, we're different in, in perhaps in our society. So clearly, socio-cultural norms about exercise uh, is crucial, as we know, uh, for muscle strength, uh, bone density. Again, we've seen that in earlier pictures balance uh, musculoskeletal health. So one of the major reasons why older women have higher levels of disability than older men is because of musculoskeletal problems. Uh, their, their, their bone health, their musculature, and so on is much worse. And that relates both to earlier on their life course, but also in later life, that they're less likely to be doing weight-bearing exercises, other exercises, and so on. And if you're wearing a burqa, it's very hard to do much exercise. So when I'm in Saudi Arabia, I try and walk very fast. People think I'm completely mad. But, you know, uh, but, but again, you never see another woman walking alone because it's not, uh, not kind of acceptable. Uh, and uh, I don't think I've ever seen hardly anybody on a bicycle, but cycling is kind of difficult too. So you're, you're kind of, you know, you, what the norms are about dress and clothing impact on exercise. And if I can just go back to an earlier Christine slide as well, um, the, the, the one of the shoes and the feet was wonderful, and what are called hammer toes uh, from wearing pointed shoes. Uh, and my mother, who ended up in a nursing home in the late 80s, she had the most terrible hammer toes, and she could hardly walk in her last years. And that's because she was a very glamorous woman who was always very fashionable, and that was great. But actually, the long-term impact of some of those fashionable things in later life. So trouble with feet if you've got troubles with your feet, you can't do all sorts of things and exercise and well-being. They're important for well-being. Okay, and obviously socio-cultural norms about diet, food, obesity, and so on. And obviously women's role in food preparation, uh, if they're very much into a home and food, then actually it, it's harder for women often to uh, you know, control um, their, their weight and so on. But obviously all those things are interconnected. So norms about dress and clothing impacting on exercise, impacting on obesity and diet, which impacts back onto exercise and so on and so forth. So we need to be aware of differences between societies in terms of socio-cultural norms, but also within our society. To what extent are there different cultural or ethnic groups uh, in our own societies um, which affect women particularly more so than men about dress, exercise, going out by yourself and so on and having uh, profound health consequences. So in the UK for example older women from the Bangladeshi community have the poorest health of any groups uh, and so but actually older Chinese women have the best health better than white women. So I think we need to not just lump all ethnic groups but look at those different cultural and ethnic groups and how gender roles in those different cultures may be actually having really quite adverse health impacts. Okay, now this is back on boring, no not boring, important stuff, um, which again we've seen before and I had to send my slides a week ago you see so I, I would have changed them if I could have done them last night but I didn't. Okay, well, this is just a, a, a normal sort of um, expectation of life differences. And what we can see is that France uh, has, in fact, a really high sex difference in expectation of life. So women are living nearly 85 years, uh, men only 78 years. It's a big difference. Uh, and it's the same sort of difference in Japan. And Japan is the most long-lived kind of you know, country there is. But w men do better in Japan than uh, France, and actually women do as well. But then you've got poor old England down here, and our sex difference has got going shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. So it used to be six years, about 20 years ago, the sex difference, and it's gone down and down. Uh, and the reason men's mortality has got has more rapidly improved than women's mortality. So particularly from coronary heart disease, there's been a, a very rapid fall in coronary heart disease for, for men and less for women. But I'm not putting this up to explain anything, but there are really important differences. So it's not just sex, clearly, obviously, uh, leading to these large differences uh, and why, you know, w well, why there seems to be just a small gender difference or sex difference in expectation of life in the UK, much, much larger in Japan and France. And then you get down to Russia, 
uh, and the last 20 so years, 25 years, men have out, sorry, women have outlived men by 11 or 12 years. I mean, this is extraordinary, an extraordinary gender difference in mortality. I mean, this is kind of real and huge. Uh, and so expectation of life for men is under 65 years. I mean, it's just massive. So we need to be looking in a kind of nuanced way cross-culturally at what's going on in terms of the different aspects of gender roles, men's roles and women's roles in these societies to understand them. And I've got this for age older people, and it's a similar sort of pattern, so I don't want to say much, but again, Japan and, and, and France, nearly five years or just over five years, women live longer. Once you get to 60, you've got that gap. And in Britain, huh, only live 2.7 years. So we've got greater gender equality, but actually <laughs> women don't live so long. So is gender equality good or is it actually not good? Uh, so, but the result is we've got more older couples aging together, which could be a good thing because they can support each other. Um, I just want to go back very quickly to this. And we've got the United States, the uh, um, you know, richest country in the world, clearly. Um, not only got quite a big, well, reasonable sex difference, but actually, expectation of life for men is really low, 76. Um, and women, it's low as well, only 81. And that relates to the degree of inequality in those societies. So America might be the land of the free and the great and the rich, but it's an incredibly unequal society. So again, that's partly racial differences. Black men, about 12 years lower life expectancy than white men but also class differences as well are huge. So again, the longest lived countries are often more equal countries. So Scandinavia, very long lived, Japan, very long lived. Unfortunately, the UK is not terribly equal and getting less equal as a neoliberal country. So that's all part of that as well. Okay, let's move on. Okay, one effect of the the sex ratios where you've got, a, sorry, not sex ratios, well, that's what I mean, sex ratios. I didn't mean sex ratios. I meant sex differences, sorry. Um, that where you've got a much larger, uh, a larger sex gap in expectation of life, as in France and Japan, um, what you often, you obviously have is a greater feminization of later life. So this is purely looking at the, oh, it is sex ratios, the proportion of women to men in each age group. So, in the early 60s, there are roughly equal numbers of men and women in those societies, just 10% yeah, more, 5% more, oh no, sorry, a few percent more women than men. Uh, but that, uh, the, the numerical predominance of women, the, the greater number of women than men, increases across the age range. So when we get to the late 70s in France, there are about 50% more women in their late 70s than men. Uh, when we get to the uh, 80s, early 80s, it's about kind of 70 or percent more women than men. When we get to the late 80s, uh, we've got well over twice as many women in France who are in their late 80s than men in their late 80s. And when we get to the 90s, you've got three and a half times more women uh, in alive over 90 than men in both France and Japan. Whereas in the UK, we've still got a feminization of later life, more women than men, but it's not so stark. So when we're talking about aging, the burden of older people, isn't it terrible? We've got so many older people, it costs them so much money and so on. We're, norm we're by and large talking about older women as the burden on society, if we're using that sort of discourse and terminology. Uh, and more so in some countries uh, than in other countries. Okay. So, sex ratios. Um, I think we probably know most of this, that sex ratios in later life, the more women there are, the men are mainly influenced by gender differences in mortality across the life course. And these obviously differ between societies because of a whole range of factors. Uh, one is men and women's roles in paid employment. And we've had some really good sessions talking about that today. Uh, another is men and women, men's and women's lifestyles, risk-taking behaviours, smoking, alcohol, exercise, diet, car accidents linked to alcohol, linked to all sorts of other things. Uh, sleep, I could say as well. Uh, and that men in general are more likely to be risky behavior. But how important that is, is, is you know, will vary between societies and so on. 
In some societies, women's reproductive roles are important, but not in our society, I think, fortunately. Uh, another important aspect is gender differences in use of health care. Uh, and to what extent, you know, some of that sex differences in mortality uh, to the advantage of women is that women use health care more, they go earlier to health care, uh, whereas men are seen as more stoical, don't want to bother the doctor, carry on working nonetheless and so on, sometimes see health care as feminine and so on. Um, and again, in some societies, issues about the cultural valuation of women and that women have less access to health care and so on and so forth can affect it, but not in our society. But the extent to which the uh, gender gap in mortality or sex gap in mortality is, is declining, uh, as it is in the UK, uh, is leading to a decreasing feminisation uh, of later life. Right. Um, a high sex ratio in later life, uh, the more women there are than men, uh, implies uh, a high number of older women living as widows. Uh, and that is both... Um, I didn't, I didn't think, I just should have this anyway, I don't know. Anyway, but the, the part of it is that, to, that women, obviously, women um, both live longer than men, uh, their potential husbands, but obviously there's a, there's, a, there's a gender gap in marriage ages, so that typically, in the UK anyway, uh, husbands are more likely to be two, three, four years older than their wives. But there's also a very big, li greater likelihood of men remarrying, and there's a bigger gender age gap uh, in remarriage. So what I'm trying to say, not very clearly, um, is that women, certainly in the UK, can expect to be uh, widowed for about, on average, nine years. But in France, that l average length of widowhood is likely to be longer. So women can be, expect to have really long periods of their life as a widow. And the larger the marriage age gap, so if you get Indian society in Saudi Arabia or India, where there's often a very big age gap, then a lot of these women are on average widowed for 20 years, 25 years, very long periods of time. And as I mentioned, there are higher remarriage rates for, for men who are widowed uh, than, for widow, for, than for women. So we need to also understand what is the meaning and experience of living as a widow uh, in different societies. Um, Material and financial resources of older women uh, in many societies, or older widows, uh, is often low. Um, what are the meaning and possibilities of living alone? Is it an advantage or a disadvantage to live alone as a, as a widow? Um, what is the cultural valuation of, of widows, again, in our society? Yeah, it's okay. Um, but if you go to India or some other society, the cultural valuation of a widow is very, very low. You know, to what extent can widows be involved in social and productive roles and so on? Where widows are co-residing with children and grandchildren, is this something they, they have a choice to do and they want to do, or do they have to do it because there's no other financial way of actually living? And if it's a necessity and they're kind of prisoners almost in the home of their you know, children who don't really want them to be there, but there's no option, then it can be really a, a, a you know, very negative uh, situation. And to what extent there's a, abuse of older widows, which again links in as well in the societies where widows are culturally not valued and where they, that they have very little financial resources, there's often high levels of abuse uh, of older widows. So a key issue really is then, is what's the access to care if a, an older woman, an older widow, becomes frail or disabled. Um, one of the things I, I could have talked more about, but I won't, but I think what I want to emphasise is the key importance of marital status in later life. And we talked a lot about intersectionality and importance of class and, and, um, and race and um, sexuality uh, and as different sorts of dimensions, um, but also marital status is another, or partnership status, is another aspect of intersectionality which I think we need to be, look at as well. Because married people, both married men and women, tend to be advantaged on all measures. They have better health, they're advantaged in terms of income, pensions, housing, and so on. Uh, if they're co-residing, or people who are co-residing, uh, both couples and others, you get material support, caring support, emotional support, and so on, compared with living alone. So it's very important. But So an issue is what are the implications for access to care if a, an older person becomes frail, disabled, or cognitively impaired, and what are the 
the implications of living alone. So if you're not married in later life, you're more likely to live alone, and what are the implications of that? So what I want to... I haven't got a table here, a good excuse, is I want to talk a bit about, but I'm going to say quite quickly, is the ways in which the availability of caregivers for frail elders, this is not all older people, but frail elders who physically got uh, impairments or have got cognitive impairments. And we need to look at the impact of forced societal changes, decline in fertility, changes in marital spaces and, and family structures, impact of paid employment and migration. Uh, and I'm going to go quite quickly through these. Clearly, demographic changes, we've had quite substantial falls in fertility, fairly stable in most of Europe, though, but increase in one or two child families. What we're seeing strongly is an increase in childlessness in most uh, Western societies, what we might call truncated families. So to what extent is there a lack of availability of family carers from the adult child and the grandchild generation for um, older people who require um, care. And then there's obviously impact of geographical mobility of children who may live far away from their parents and so on. Um, this is just data from the UK uh, on marital status. And I think it's kind of, to me, it, it kind of hits you between the eyes when I get the pen going. Um, that uh, for men, about three quarters of men right up until they're, they're eight, 80 uh, are married. So older men tend to be married. To so marriage is normative for older men. Even in their early 80s, two-thirds uh, of men in their early 80s are still married. And even over the age of 85, half are still married. So married men can expect to die married. It's, it's very normative. Whereas women, you've got quite a different situation in the UK and other countries that, yes, if you're in the 60s, you know, nearly two-thirds are married. Uh, but then by the time you get to the early 80s, it's less than a quarter married. By the time they're over 85, it's very rare to be a married woman because, you know, they've died off, basically. And the men, as we said, remarry again. So widowhood is, the, is normative for older women uh, so that by the time you get to the 80s, you've got the majority, 60% in the early 80s, uh, over three quarters in the late 80s as widowed. But what's also terribly important to be uh, looking at and understanding is the impact of divorce and separation. And this is often from earlier generations of people who divorce. And this is the group of people who are entering later life as divorced, as well as some who get divorced in later life. And there are now more divorced men uh, in up to the age of 75 than widowed men. So divorce is actually becoming very important to look at in later life. And we've never really looked at it in a lot of detail, and similarly for women as well. But th th those... They, they, they'll cre and with time, they'll creep up. Those figures will increase. So, marriage is normative for older men. Widowhood is normative for older women. Increase in divorce. 14% of men and women over 65 would be divorced in 2021. But then, obviously, we've got new family structures because of divorce. So, issues are to what extent, if you remarry, are your stepchildren as willing to provide care for you or other elders or not? And we, we know less about these things than we should do about kind of reconstituted families and caregiving in them. And obviously increasing in increases in repartnering, cohabitation, same-sex relationships in later life. These are all hugely important studies, uh, issues to study, uh, in terms of the impact on caregiving. You know, so will new partners be as willing to care for partners with dementia as lifelong partners are, uh, and so on? So we know... We, we lack data on many of these things, but they're critically important as research topics. Um, employment issues are that clearly we've had a very big increase in women's employment over recent years. So uh, there are issues about, you know, who provides care and so on. We'll talk about that. Okay. Um, but at the same time, we've got the, the big increases in employment. We've, uh, we've also got in the UK a policy driver for later retirement ages. So we've all got to work till our, to, to get our pension till we're 66 and 67 and so on and so forth. So, so to what extent women and men in mid and later life will be less available to provide elder care for very aged parents or for their partners? And if women give up work to provide elder care, which they often do to provide for aging parents uh, and partners, then they obviously have financial and pension penalties because of that. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. 
Okay, so in terms of caregiving for elders who are frail or disabled or cognitively impaired, um, in a multi-generational household, there's caregiving, but it's very invisible. It's mainly done by women, but there aren't very large numbers of multi-generational households in, in, in the UK, probably in France only. In couple-only households where you've got husband and wife, wives care for their husband, and in the UK, uh, husbands equally or almost equally care for wives. So it's normative now for men to, to be really main caregivers for disabled spouses, and that's the case in Scandinavia as well. Uh, I don't know the work in other countries. Uh, I know some work in Japan where Japanese men do not care for their wives. That's quite clear. Um, but we need to understand more about under what circumstances do spouses, male spouses, male partners, care for their female partners when they are uh, you know, frail and disabled and need that care. I don't know the situation in France. But if, people, if an older person lives alone, then there's, it puts into very sharp relief who provides that care. Is it daughters or daughters-in-law, if they have children? Is it sons, sons-in-law? Unlikely. Um, no, 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 no. Sons do provide quite a lot of care. Um, is it friends? Is it people in the community or neighbours, whatever that means? Is it voluntary organisations? Is it the state? And so on. So we need to look very critically at who provides care. And one of the issues for health carers, health care, the health professions, you know, you go into hospital, somebody goes to hospital, and they assume somebody can care for them when they go, go home. So I think there's often this assumption of health carers that people have family, or they, people have caregivers, they have somebody to go home to. And a lot of people, particularly older women, don't have people who they can care for, or easily, easily call on to provide that. Okay, a key issue, I think, is that none of us want to be physically impaired and become frail, but unfortunately, many of us will become that. We don't know when, but we may well become physically impaired and frail. And what, if we do become physically impaired and frail, we don't want to become dependent on other people. All the research shows people don't want to be dependent. You, we don't want to lose autonomy. We don't want to have what they call a social handicap. We certainly don't want to enter residential care, or most people say they don't want to enter residential care. But, the, but what it, gender, women are, tend to be disadvantaged because if you get a physical impairment in, in, or frailty, there are factors which lead to whether you're going to become dependent, lose autonomy, or enter residential care. And they relate very strongly to access to material resources and financial resources and cultural resources. So the more financial resources you have, material resources, cultural resources, the more likely are you can live as a physically impaired, frail person, but still maintain independence and autonomy and not enter residential care. But women, older women, are less likely to have those material resources and financial resources. And similarly, on the other side, access to supportive caring resources. So if you've got a wonderful wife or husband who's caring for you and you've got dementia, that's great because you can probably remain in your own home and remain fairly independent, autonomous and so on. But if you haven't got access to those supportive caring resources, then the likelihood is you might become dependent, uh, lose autonomy, enter residential care. So women tend to be disadvantaged by having less of those things or to, to a certain or to a certain extent. So, just to finalise, I'll pick up my paper for about the last time. Right, okay, <laughs> okay. The f this wasn't designed for somebody to speak from, that you've got to have notes here. Okay, the future. Um, unfortunately, in the UK and much of Europe, we have something called austerity uh, and neoliberal uh, welfare policies. And the impact of austerity and neoliberal welfare policies are basically to reduce all sorts of welfare services. And it's older women who will be hit the hardest by those reductions. So reductions in public transport, a crucial for older women, they don't drive, they don't have the money, uh, declining in health services and domiciliary support services and older people's you know, welfare services, community, I don't know, <laughs> services and so on. Um, so that, that their gender, we need to look at social and look at the gendered effects. So that those social policies and austerity has gendered effects. It has greater effects, adverse effects on women than it does on men. But women do have greater, better social support. Then. The other thing which we're seeing in wonderful neoliberal UK is a growth in inequality among women and among men, uh, among older, 
And divorce, for example, divorced women and men are very disadvantaged and they're a rapidly increasing group. Uh, that's another talk. Well, married men and women are most advantages, advantaged. So we've got to look at, in detail, the implications of increased inequalities by income, which is what we're seeing, and encouraging people to live, work longer is increasing inequalities, because I can work longer, I'm fit, for example, at the moment. Uh, but other people, if you've had a hard manual job all your life, you can't work in your late 60s. So that some of these policies are having increasing inequality uh, and increasing gender inequality as well as class inequalities and so on. Okay, so my first set of conclusions uh, relating to gender and family caregiving for elders. Older women, uh, because they live longer, they live alone, they're widowed, are the main recipients of care and they're more likely to be frail, disabled and so on. Uh, main recipients of family care. But midlife women uh, are the main providers of those care, that care. So welfare state policies are fundamental to care provision for elders. So if there are more welfare state policies, then that will ease the burden on the family and others uh, uh, to, to, to care for old people. So employment policies also influence the availability of family caregivers. So if you've got to keep working, it's actually hard to be a family caregiver. So we need to look at the interconnections between families, labour markets and state policies and between the public and the private spheres are all interconnected. A second whole issue is the interconnection between gender and generation. The older generation women increasingly support daughters, paid employment by providing grandchild care and financial support as well, but the grandchild care may constrain their own active ageing, self-realisation, and potentially re reduce their own pension income. Uh, and midlife women who are providing elder care for their parents' parents-in-law may, may be constraining their own employment and reducing their own future pension income and well-being in later life. And finally, uh, just to emphasise the key impact of marital or partnership status as another aspect of intersectionality, that marital status affects many aspects of the lives of older men and women, but often in different ways by gender. We need to understand why and what the implications are. Older married people, both men and women, tend to be advantaged, both in terms of health and access to material resources and caring resources. But the majority, about 70% of older men are married uh, across nearly all societies, whereas the majority, most older women, are widowed, not married. So widowed older women tend to be more disadvantaged financially and their access to caregivers, particularly because they're uh, living alone. So the problems of providing care to the growing ageing population, uh, which we hear a lot about in the media, largely represents a problem of providing care to older women uh, and older women who are living as widows. And whether this is a problem uh, and such women are vulnerable to social exclusion is likely to vary between societies related to, firstly, the nature of welfare provision in that society and how that's changing. Secondly, cultural norms about family relationships and living arrangements. Uh, and finally, the cultural valuation uh, of older women. Thank you very much.